In his video, the introspective argument in inspiring philosophy presented the critique of reductive materialism, which I'm now going to show you and then respond to. Premise 2. The properties of the mind are not that which matter can have. This can be seen with the difference between mental properties and physical properties. Consider two things, feeling pain and an electrical signal to the brain. Are they the same thing? Of course not, because an electrical signal to the brain can happen without the feeling of pain. What we experience is a correlation between an electrical signal and the mental feeling of pain. But one can see the coherence of a possible world where one experiences pain without the need for an electrical signal. The atheist philosopher Thomas Nagel says, if a mental event is really a physical event in this sense and nothing else, then the physical event by itself, once its physical properties are understood, should likewise be sufficient for the taste of sugar, the feeling of pain, or whatever it is supposed to be identical with. But it doesn't seem to be. It seems conceivable for any physical event, there should be a physical event without any experience at all. Experience of taste seems to be something extra, contingently related to the brain states, something produced rather than constituted by the brain state. So it cannot be identical to the brain state in the way that water is identical to H2O. The point is that things like qualia are not physical substances. What we experience is mental substances like qualia, and then we assume they come from physical substances in and of themselves. But a mental substance, like the taste of sugar, does not exist with the physical substance. They are nothing more than the mental experience and all we really know. And then we just assume they correlate to physical properties. Therefore, upon examination, mental properties and physical properties are conceptually detached. No amount of introspection can ever reduce to the chemistry of the brain. Because there's nothing about introspection that leads you to sense that your subjectivity is at all dependent or even related to voltage changes and chemical interactions going on inside your head. Okay, you can, you can feel, you can drop acid, you can meditate for a year, you can do whatever you want to perturb your nervous system. You can, you can feel yourself to be one with the universe, and at no point in that transformation do you get a glimpse that there's a hundred trillion neurons in your head, uh, or synapses in your head, that, that are doing anything. But since we know that the mental experience is not a necessary property of a physical substance, then they cannot be the same thing, and the mental substance is something separate in all we truly experience. Thus, our first conclusion is, mind is not reducible to matter. Let's summarize IP's arguments. 1. We can conceive coherent situations in which mental experiences occur unrelated to physical events. 2. Introspection doesn't allow us to reduce mental experience to brain chemistry. The reasoning behind the first argument is this. 1. Mental and physical properties are not necessarily correlated for there are conceivable situations where the firsts can exist without the seconds. 2. It follows they really aren't the same thing. Clearly minds always need being conceived, sharing at least some properties with our minds, thus being the ones that determine if the mind is material or not. Otherwise, we would have no reason not to assume that minds exist separately from matter in possible situations just because they are different from our minds. The argument rests on the notion that the conceivability is evidence of the metaphysical possibility of a scenario. Certainly, we can conceive hypothetical situations and verify if an entity could exist in them but the conceptions are necessarily bound to knowledge. If one ignores the actual properties of an entity, he won't be able to reliably conceive its metaphysical possibilities. Nothing guarantees that the conceptions are necessarily correct, as they are just mental approximations of the real thing, and all we can use as measurement of their accuracy is our prior knowledge. We therefore acquire extensive information, which can be obtained by observing the entity in question in various real-life scenarios. But when such information is extensive, 
as it is on the topic of mind-body dependence, using conception in the first place to determine metaphysical possibilities seems moot. This is a criticism against arguments from conceivability in general. They mean little when you don't know much about the properties of the conceived entity, and they become redundant when you do. Why conceive a situation when ones akin to it have already been observed? Besides, I find myself unable to conceive an immaterial mind. I don't even know how it is possible to fathom any immaterial entity. At most, I can think of something which, despite being unperceivable, still has to occupy space. So right off the bat, I don't know where IP is coming from. Let's now move to the second argument. IP believes that if minds were generated by brain chemistry, through introspection one ought to be able to get a glimpse of, say, the chemistry, and he interprets our inability to do so as evidence that the minds are detached from the physical. But what does IP think we should be able to see? We do have glimpses of something when we introspect, and even though we are unable to determine what it is, it could well be our brain chemistry. Unless IP establishes what we ought to be able to observe if our brains generated our minds, his argument has no weight. In conclusion, I believe both arguments by IP against the reductive materialism come up short. Thank you for watching.